Welcome to the damage report. Today in the news, insane reactions on both sides to the sinking of the flagship of Russia's Black Sea fleet. We've got Jen Psaki smoothly transitioning into her post Biden administration role in the media by mocking Peter Ducey of Fox News. That's gonna be fun. And in the 2024 presidential election, will we even have debates at all? It's not looking like a sure thing at this point. All that and more to be broken down on today's episode with me, John Adarola, and the host of so much happy half hour, sometimes game busters, sometimes other things. Brett Ehrlich, how's it going? Oh my God, I'm so happy. For people behind the scenes, was crazy. I joined the show Skype during the intro. I do uh-huh. want to take a moment to tell everybody, like John really wants one of these, and you know, this oh shows God. up for one of these, and only very select people have their own name on one of these. I'm one of them. Mm-hmm. It was 12 years ago, but still <laughs> those of us who are clinging to relevancy want to do so myself. I'm talking about myself here by by affiliating themselves with people who are wildly relevant right now. And that's John Iderola, Marissa and Sophie and Skip and everyone else who contributes to the damage report. Million other people that all do great work. Fewer than you'd think just because of resources, but tyt.com slash vote, get in there, do it now. Get John another toy. Exactly, thank you. And then someday I too can use it as a literal doorstop in my house, (laughs) Brett. No, I will not be doing that. If we get a Webby, you're gonna see it right here. I don't know which of the toys or Funkos are gonna have to go, but we're gonna have it in the background. You can get us there by voting at tyt.com slash vote every day. We've got a nice comfortable lead. But you know what? I think we can be even more comfortable than comfortable. That is the quest of my life and we're gonna apply it to this as well. In any event, Brett, thank you for being here. Thank you everyone for watching and listening. We appreciate you being here. We got so much news we're gonna break down for you today. And if you're on a platform that allows for the liking of things, please do that so that people know we're live and the notifications go out. And if you wanna respond to anything we talk about with questions, comments, concerns, we'll respond to you during our breaks. With all that said, Brett Ehrlich. Do you want to get into this thing? Desperately. Let's do it, starting off with some fun with this. Я не хотел говорить о крейсере Москве, тем более, чтобы были разные пуски. Но вы сказали, крейсер Москва это абсолютное повод для войны, стопроцентный, это флагман наш. Подумать об уничтожении железнодорожных узлов, там, конечно, вопросики, они все едут и едут, я имею в виду лидеры. Но лидеров надо предупредить, пусть дома сидят. Надо по Киеву, тогда они приедут. Вот что нужно сделать. Вот этого не должно быть никогда. То, что мы сейчас видим на экране. So if you were wondering how state TV in Russia was handling the sinking of the warship Moskva, uh, not well, uh, kind of freaking out there, calling for World War III as a result of it. In fact, here is a photo of this ship. You might be familiar with it for a number of reasons. Uh, one, it is the flagship of Russia's Black Sea Fleet. It's also the actual ship that showed up very early on in the war that threatened the uh, Ukrainian soldiers on Snake Island and then were told to go F themselves. Well, they have now gone and F themselves, I guess, to the bottom of the sea. But anyway, those uh, pundits and hosts on Russian state TV were not handling it well. Uh, The first gentleman that you heard goes on to say, even the fact there is an attack against our territory is now like we we were doing this special operation no more. Now it is all out war. Immediate throws in, he sounds as angry as an old man trying to send back soup in a deli, which I think is a line from Seinfeld. Anyway, uh, for real, no fooling around anymore. What's it called? What are we waging right now? Uh, this special operation ended. It ended last night when our motherland was attacked. So the motherland, by the way, is that ship, which at the same time, Russia is gonna go on to claim wasn't actually attacked. It was totally just an accident that caused it to go to the bottom of the sea. But he's saying now you attacked us, so now it's on. Dude, you started it. That's like you just tackled someone to the ground. They reached up and just lightly slapped you and now you're freaking out. You know what's a great way to not have your ships be sunk? Don't invade other countries. I think that's general advice that applies to Russia and every other country, including the United States. A lot less ships are sunk when you don't launch barbaric illegal wars. Brett, what do you think? Right, the Pentagon cannot confirm or deny that this was an attack by the Ukrainian military or if it was what the Russians ended up saying, which was like, ah, it was fire, but also you did it anyway. 
But what you see from the Russians right now is the consequence of having such a state run media apparatus for so long in in being able to exist in your own bubble and not having it face outward that you now like you realize they're bad at it. They're like the people who've been in a cave and so they don't have they just like come and they, they step out into the light and they don't know how to react. They're yeah. so bad at spinning this. They're spinning it three or four different ways. And if and anyone who's spun a basketball knows, you just have to spin it one way fast enough, and it'll stay upright. Right now, they're all just like spinning the ball in different yeah. directions, and it's pathetic. Exactly. And let's be clear. So as so far as I know, it had been on fire. It was being towed away to be repaired. So I I am assuming that there was no loss of life. That as as it's in the process of sinking, they're able to get the people off. It had been with other ships. And I don't want any of those soldiers to die, the sailors. I don't want the ship to go down. I didn't want the war. And I assume, by the way, many Russian soldiers probably share my position on that. Unfortunately, um, they are not in charge. But at the same time that the uh, the pundits and the the hosts on Russian state TV are freaking out about this, um, the other side is having a bit of a victory lap. Uh, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky thanked, "quote Those who showed that Russian warships can sail away, even if it's to the bottom," during a public address on Thursday night. Um, a uh, the Minister of Defense of Ukraine tweeted, "A flagship Russian warship is a worthy diving site. We have one more diving spot in the Black Sea now." We'll definitely visit the wreck after a visit in the war. By the way, I already have 300 scuba dives. I love that it's sort of like getting in a dig about the war, but it's also like kind of braggy. Yeah, absolutely. 300, that's impressive. Uh, and finally, a um, member of parliament, Alessia Vasilenko says, Moskva battleship went down with missiles and ammo used to target Ukrainian cities and towns. Now it's part of the submarine fleet. So they're having some fun with it. And by the way, this particular um, ship was able to hold and then eventually fire 17 long range cruise missiles. So it's a significant piece of military hardware. And considering all the devastation that has been you know, wreaked not only against the Ukrainian uh, military, but against civilians specifically recently, uh, I get why they would want to have a little bit of fun with this. But not every country does that. I think it's worth saying this is a particular like cold country Eastern European way of talking to each other back and forth. Like this is fascinating. They're getting in like silly punches while people are yeah. dying. And that's, that's kind true. of the MO of of this part of the world when it comes to war. It's just like, no, we go long. You know, don't don't mess with us. But like yeah. we're we're not only dangerous, we're crazy. Um, is like the branding of it, and also like I, a deadpan situation is they're being super super mean uh, to you. A hundred percent. And you might well be right, but I wonder, especially after this, like in the next war that the U.S. needlessly enters into, are we sure that like Lauren Boebert wouldn't be tweeting things like this? I, I don't know, I guess we'll see. It wouldn't be anyway. as funny for all that the right complains about the death of humor. Like this humor, this dark humor is just landing. Like to say, hey, good job, you know, submarine fleet, idiots. Exactly, it is. It's like a line from a TV show. Anyway, um, so I'm look, I'm getting a bit of Schadenfreude, a bit of chuckles out of this. You know what I would prefer though? Uh, Russia, get your soldiers, get your ships, get your tanks out of Ukraine. And it's worth no more will blow up. I yeah, it's worth. Great. I don't want there to be a war. It's worth like hanging a lantern on this. Like, look at the one of the many arguments you mentioned it earlier coming from the Russians. It's we're escalating this because you had the gall to attack us and we won't stand for anyone attacking us. Exactly. In on our land. And this is in the sea, but like on our territory in the Black Sea. Yeah. That is insane. There is no one in the world like fog of war aside, whether it's an attack by of missiles from the Ukrainians that say they they shot their Neptune missiles at it or if it's a fire that broke out by accident. The Russians are saying something absolutely crazy, which is now that you're attacking us on our land, that's a bridge too far. Whoever exactly. would stand for that kind of behavior, well, yeah. you're, you're expecting the Ukrainians to, you morons.
I, yeah, doinks, that's what I would say. Um, okay, I got a couple quick updates. I want your fast reactions to these. So the first is about this back and forth, which you're alluding to. Both Russia and Ukraine said that ammunition had detonated aboard the Moskva, forcing the crew to evacuate, but they had different explanations for why that was. Ukrainians say that they struck it with a missile that caused the explosion, which obviously Russia doesn't like the idea of that, so they might lie about it. Um, Russia says that ammunition exploded due to a fire, and then the cruiser, cruiser ship sank in stormy sea conditions. As people are noting online, the sea was angry that day, my friends. Is that better though? Like, okay, you don't wanna say that the Ukrainians hit you with a missile, but the idea that ammunition is just spontaneously exploding, and then the wrath of the sea gods themselves took your ship out, apparently. Does that make your military look better? Right. It's a we're, wash at best. We're not weak, we're incompetent. <laughs> we're incompetent and then we like to follow up our needless fire explosion with sinking below the sea. What are they gonna be hit by an earthquake next? Is the avatar <laughs> like on the ground? Anyway, um, in addition to the ship being lost and its ability to you know, wage war in that area, something else might have been lost. And this is where we're gonna need to bring in an expert like Indiana Jones. But a news report from 2020 has given rise to the question of whether the vessel sank with a Christian relic, a piece of the true cross on board. The relic is a fragment of wood just millimeters large that according to believers is a piece of the cross on which Christ was crucified. That fragment is embedded in a 19th century metal cross, which is itself kept in a reliquary. And uh, so maybe a bit of the actual cross of Christ was taken out. I would assume if I was one of the soldiers evacuating, I'd grab the cross if I really believe that it was part of it. So maybe it's safe, maybe. I, I, all I gotta say is if anyone's traveled Europe or like watched a Rick Steves PBS report on Europe, everybody's got a piece of that cross. Like uh -huh. you'll be going through, like he'll be like, you can get delicious Parmesan cheese from the hills of Parma. <laughs> also, these these each one of these pigs that makes prosciutto di Parma is stuffed with little pieces of the original cross. Like there's <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of these little shards going on. Uh, yeah. So so I feel, and let's be honest, it probably yeah. Is if you want the true cross, no, we don't know where the man's cross body's bread. at. Then yeah. Well, exactly. Yeah. If we don't, yeah. That's absolutely ridiculous. Where can I get some ark? I want some shards of ark, like goats. Do I do I dig inside the goats for the shards of ark? I don't know. Okay, with that, we're gonna turn back to the US and uh, give you one of the big domestic uh, political news developments of the day. Let's jump to this. Public service announcement, if the chat's good, we can get a cat on camera, by the way, that'll happen. I, well, I think that we might have to move towards that. In fact, I'm gonna give you a like challenge, everyone. If we can get to 1000 in a time that I consider reasonable, we'll give you a cat. But first, apologies to the director. Okay, now we're gonna, we're gonna jump into this news here. CNN has revealed yet more text messages that were going back and forth between extremely powerful and politically connected Republicans after the 2020 election and before the insurrection. In this case, coming from Senator Mike Lee and Representative Chip Roy, and oh boy, does it reveal a lot. So first of all, I need you to understand who Mike Lee is, who he was in the lead up to that election. He said on October 7th, we're not a democracy. And he is uh, technically right in a needlessly pedantic way. We're a representative um, a democratic republic. Um, but that I think was less of a statement of fact and more of like a social media vision board situation because he would soon transition into working to make sure that we were both technically and realistically not a democracy. On November 7th, he sent a text message to Mark Meadows saying, I wanna offer words of encouragement to the president and have reached out to Molly for that reason. That's Molly Michael, Trump's executive assistant. This doesn't have to come down to a binary choice between an immediate concession, cuz he'd lost, you know, and a destruction of the credibility of the election process. That said, he's got some plans that might lead more towards one of those than the other. So uh, first though, let's jump to Chip Roy, who on the same day messaged Mark Meadows to say, by the way, remember, Mark Meadows is as close to Trump as anyone at this point. Good, be well. If you're still in the game, dude, we need ammo. We need fraud examples. We need it this weekend. And Mark Meadows says we are working on exactly that. And if you are a conservative or a Republican watching this, I want you to just briefly try to grapple with the idea that four days after the election, the closest allies to Trump are saying, 
you gotta find something. And Mark was like, yeah, no, we're looking. We're totally trying to find something because you at that point likely were already days into believing that this was an open and shut case. They'd already proved that the election had been stolen. No, behind the scenes in private to each other, they're saying, we're looking, man. We're trying to get you that ammo. We're gonna get you something. It is that's what I find most fascinating, Brett, about these. It's it shows us the gap between what they were pretending to believe in public and what they were doing behind the scenes. So that's your most shocking moment. If we could go back to graphic three, the most shocking yeah. moment for me is when I see Chip Roy text the word dude. <laughs> <laughs> dude, dude, it's me, dude, Chip. Where's dude, my ammo? <laughs> like, where's my ammo? No, that's that's absolutely right. They are trying to sell something in public, and it should go without saying. This is what they do everywhere. This disconnect between, like, this inconsistency, this strange grappling for any any you know bit of reality to spin an insane uh, non reality around like they can't they have they have such low standards and they can't even hit those totally meanwhile like yeah. you're looking at i think was it meadows there's like two identical right wing guys that i think it was meadows one of them is um had to vacate his voter registration cuz he himself registered meadows. Meadows registered in North Carolina and basically committed what, in my opinion, I would very easily say, if not legally, then just as a concept, is voter fraud. Is voter fraud, exactly. Where he, he registered at an address he'd never been to. Yep. Now, on Snake Mountain. Uh, yeah. And so, and that's like, that is what, that is the reality that they are trying to get you to live in or depart from. And and uh, make you believe that the 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 entire election was stolen when they themselves were in charge of all the states that they say it was stolen in. That's exactly. another point. Well, look, there's a thread of incompetence that flows through this. So let's can we have just a moment of fun? I love this, and we're gonna we're gonna have more fun with the story than probably any other source. Mike Lee, so Mike Lee had sent this letter of support privately via text to Mark Meadows, listing all these different names that are down to do whatever is necessary. And Mike Lee says, we're sending this as a private communication from us to him, Trump, through you. We are not issuing it as a press release. And if it's helpful for you to leak it, feel free to do so. And Mark Meadows responds, question mark, question mark. Like he doesn't even know, like that Mike Lee's like, we've got your back and we you we can do it publicly, we can do it privately. And Mark was like, what? I don't like we're, dude, we're busy. We're working 14 hours a day on this. So anyway, uh Mike Lee goes on to say, Sydney Powell is saying she needs to get in to see the president, but she's being kept away from him. Apparently, she has a strategy to keep things alive and put several states back in play. Oh, that's so revelatory. Like they know exactly what they're doing. They know that these lost they lost these states, but she's got this plot. And if we only follow her, then a couple of these states might be back in play. And look, uh, he just keeps pressing. You gotta talk to Sidney Powell. Now he eventually uh, just let's see. I think it's like 11 days later. Sidney Powell joins the effort, does the press conference. It's insane. She says a bunch of crazy stuff about Dominion and all those different uh, companies involved in the election. Then Mike Lee messages, I'm worried about the Powell press conference. The potential defamation liability for the president is significant here for the campaign and for the president personally. Unless Powell can back up everything she said, which I kind of doubt she can. And Mark Meadows says, I agree, very concerned. I would be. I love the defamation factor. Like, Think of all the embarrassing things Trump has already done to defame himself and this is they're afraid that something's going to make it worse. Uh, and the truth is all the people who had the potential to be even moderately credible looked at all the evidence or lack their lack of evidence like I'm not going to make stuff up. I have some self-respect and the a shocker here and this is this is the theme that I want to take out of it is these folks on the right they don't love America like they said they do. Like the thing about America is that we have free and fair elections and we accept the results of them when they yeah. play and when they play out according to the rules that we set out in the constitution and they did and courts said that they did. And it's important that we we acknowledge 
reality at all. And that's what's so terrifying is look at how thin the threads are that are keeping the you know fabric of America together. Yeah, exactly. Let me demonstrate those thin threads on, you know, for instance, like a grasp on reality and everything. So Mike Lee is a senator. Okay, he's a senator. He's a joke, but at the same time, also still a senator. He gets a vote on all this stuff. He was messaging Meadows. Like, did you see that last episode of Mark Levin's show? You gotta watch that, man. No, no, like you, they they are, I'm not saying they're true believers about everything. I, I often believe that they're quite cynical and don't believe the things that they're saying. But in private, when they didn't think anyone would see this, they literally think, no, Mark Levin, he's, he's winning here. He's got it, he knows what's going on, you should watch him. Anyway, at some point, and again, to demonstrate the gap between what they were telling you conservatives and what they really believed, Mike Lee, again, Senator, messages Mark Meadows. I don't think the president is grasping the distinction but what, b- between what we can do and what he would like us to do. Nor do I think he's grasping the distinction between what certain members are saying that sound like they could help him, but would really hurt him. He's got a very real opportunity for a win in 2024. That opportunity could be harmed in multiple ways this effort. Now, Mike Lee didn't and never will come forward and say any of this because he's terrified of the retribution he would face. But behind the scenes, he was saying, no, dude, we gave it our try. We tried to overthrow the election. It didn't work. Now you're, it just looks pathetic. We can't actually do the things that he's saying we should do. He also, Meadows responds that Trump thinks the VP can reject the ballots. So apparently, I guess he was actually a true believer. He really believes behind closed doors that the VP could just decide who wins and who doesn't win the election, Brett. It's just they, they are, in some ways, as crazy as they would have us believe that they are. And then also they're sticking with it after this. I love seeing these behind the scenes glimpses because when they're talking to each other, they're like, this is gonna make it a lot harder for Trump to win and implying in 2024 and implying that like they're being pushed too far potentially to a point of no return where they're not gonna return and help the guy where they're gonna switch to the other side. But as always happens on the right, no matter what, like they will tell you on Tuesday or on January 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, that they, that something is indefensible, right? They'll say it's indefensible, all these things that Trump is gonna have you believe. And then February 1st, 2nd, 3rd, they're defending it. They're defending. They're defending. That was defensible. <laughs> and and it's, it's still indefensible. But what you'll see with this, and later when we talk about the um, debate scene, they they have more and more confidence. As much as they're complaining about left wing media controlling everything, they have so much more confidence now in their right wing media bubble yeah. that they'll they'll still fight the fight, and they know that they can just get enough people to fill out the the like crazy culture war part of their party. To expand that tent, because they're never going to lose the people that know that Republicans will give tax cuts to the rich. They just yeah. need another sideshow to get people in their big, ridiculous circus tent. Yeah, hundred percent. I'm going to close with this. This last graphic. January six comes. Chip Roy messages Mark Meadows. This is an S show. Fix this now. And Mark Meadows says, "We are. They were not. They, in fact, very much were not fixing it." Anyway, with that said, we're gonna go to our first break. We got a lot to get to, including some fun. Jen Psaki asked about Peter Ducey, what she thinks about him. That's gonna be a hoot. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. It's time for a little bit of fun. Let's jump into this. So we have to talk about Peter Ducey for one second. Sure. Okay. Okay. Is he a stupid son of a bitch? Or does he play a stupid son of a bitch on TV? <laughs> okay. Um, well, um, he works for a, a network. Okay. That um, provides people with questions that nothing personal to any individual, including Peter Ducey, but might make anyone sound like a stupid son of a bitch. <laughs> Okay, so there you have Jen Psaki, who still technically is the press secretary, but very soon will be like hosting a show on MSNBC or something. It's a weird world we live in. Uh, Mocking 
Peter Doocy, let's be clear, she did say that he sounds like a stupid son of a bitch, while also providing a bit of an out. So there's still a little bit of diplomacy there, Brett. She implies, yes, he does day after day sound like a stupid son of a bitch, but it isn't his fault. It's only because Fox provided stupid questions. And if you don't remember some of these questions, Marissa did a great job of rounding up some examples. So for instance, um, she mocks Peter Ducey's question about Texas busing migrants, pointing out that it's a publicity stunt. Peter Ducey is pretending as if it's a serious demonstration of immigration policy. He's always down to give the right the best shake when they're clearly being trolls. He asked if a White House event celebrating Katanji Brown Jackson will be a super spreader. He asked questions about a video of Biden kissing Nancy Pelosi, asked a ton of questions about Hunter Biden and all that and if whether President Joe Biden would support a special counsel to look into his son posing nude in a photo or something. And so anyway, look, there have been a lot of stupid questions, Brett. What do you think about her engaging with this though? The most, so we've been doing some, uh, there's a, a channel that is basically on, on TYT's network that is basically home to every ridiculous Ducey and uh, Saki moment. So it's youtube.com slash TYT investigates reports or facebook.com slash TYT investigates. Don't ask me how I got that. But uh, what you see, the most fascinating thing is he asks versions of the same question every day. The evolution from like, is there gonna be an investigation into uh, Hunter Biden? Asked and answered the next day, it'll be like, is there gonna be a special counsel investigation into Hunter Biden? Mm -hmm. And then it just gets one extra word essentially every single day for a week. And the reason that she is right in saying this is a Fox News thing is like, if you go back and look at what's happening on that network, it's just what they're reporting on anyway. And he's just the way that they get a quote from her to stick into those stories. And yeah, yeah that's that's the short answer. Yeah, basically it's uh, wouldn't it be fun if we could have a long conversation about a special counsel? Okay, that would be good. So let's just do that even though there's no evidence that that's gonna happen. And so we'll ask a question about it pretending that it's serious. And we can always say people are asking questions when it's our people who are asking the questions. And then they can get that interaction no matter how bad he looks, it's gonna be interpreted in the most favorable light by the, the Fox audience. So you can run it anyway. It's an amazing scam that they've got going. They can just invent whatever news they want. And so that's what they did. Now, I do want to be clear. I was giving Saki a little bit of credit there for being diplomatic in that she was implying that this isn't his fault. That yes, he does sound stupid, but it's not his fault. Fox gives him these questions. To be fair, John Roberts responded saying, note to press secretary, Peter Ducey makes the decisions on what topics he wants to quiz you on and develops the questions himself. His philosophy is a basic tenet of journalism, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. If that makes all of us stupid SOBs, so be it. So first of all, he strips away the cover. No, if he sounds like a stupid son of a bitch, he worked hard to sound like a stupid son of a bitch and you will give him the credit that he's due. But also pretending that that is the, that is the journalistic philosophy that Peter Ducey is just the most recent incarnation of. He is asking serious questions to find out about what the those who are most afflicted need to know. No, he's asking dumb, dumb gotcha questions about DC personalities, that's it. There's never any substance, it's never tied to anything real, any, any actual crises. It is doing PR for Republican politicians uh, for the most part and especially for Fox News, Brett, that is all that it is. And you can tell by the smirk on his face at the end of his questions, cuz he knows it's ridiculous. He knows it's stupid. No one takes him seriously. The guy is asking about nepotism when his name is Peter Ducey. Mm -hmm. He's harping on the corruption of giving special favors and handouts to your kid when his dad is one of the three Muppets barking nonsense and as though it's a children's show, as though it's Sesame Street to everyone's grandma every morning on Fox and Friends. Yeah, 100%. And by the way, just to give you a reminder, because we haven't talked much about Fox and Friends recently, about what, and then they have Peter on all the time. Just, I think it was yesterday, I think it was Kilmeade said, those who still wear masks are psychotic. 
We're about to cruise past a million deaths. There's still between 30 and 40,000 new cases, 500 deaths on a daily basis. You are psychotic if you wear masks. That's the that's the journalistic uh, comfort the afflicted, afflict the comfortable philosophy that they are following over there uh, on Fox. I will close by saying, um, Brett, and I want your question about this. I still don't like that. She knows months in advance that she's going to be working for a particular partisan news outlet. And she's still working like to represent, it just feels like I think she can mock Peter Ducey and Fox News as much as she wants, they deserve it. But when you have your own sort of, like you're setting up a fan base now, I do think that there are some ethical concerns. I think that they're, they, they might be a bit overplayed by the right, but. I, I don't like it. It feels dirty to me. A, she already has a fan base. B, uh, this That's is a true. huge get for MSNBC because usually they only hire former Republican press secretaries. That's true too. <laughs> hey, it's balance. And that's it. And that's this is like the weird, the weird realignment we're in right now. It's yeah. MSNBC is exactly that thing people criticize them for. It is New Yorkers. Of all types that are like, I think Republicans are too dirty now. Yeah. And I'm gonna make a rich establishment coastal elites essentially feel good about not changing anything. I'm well, a, you uh, know socially progressive, but fiscally conservative. That's what it's for. And they're getting another one. And I, I still I also John Roberts. John Roberts is pretty good when he is in those press secretary circles or you know doing the press conferences. Even though he does look like a 1950s drawing in a magazine of someone intended to sell suits to people. Nice. That's a very specific thing. Uh, anyway, we, we got to get into another topic. Uh, the, the hour is uh, racing by. We had uh, said yesterday on the show that the uh, process of choosing which states are going to be voting first in the Democratic primary in the next presidential election is uh, it's in a bit of an earthquake situation right now. We don't know how it's going to shake out. That's a big change. Well, we've got another big change coming, but first, this. He hit my hands. Nobody has ever hit my hands. I've never heard of this one. Look at those hands. Are they small hands? <laughs> He referred to my hands. If they're small, something else must be small. I guarantee you there's no problem. I guarantee. Yeah, I think we can all agree that a debate is an important tradition in the United States. It, it sheds light and truth on the candidates and what they truly believe. It forces them to take positions and then stick to them once they get elected. It's a good thing we have debates or at least had debates because Maybe we won't be having these presidential debates anymore. The RNC just voted yesterday unanimously to withdraw its participation from the Commission on Presidential Debates. Now that doesn't mean we won't have debates, but that's the commission that's produced the ones that we've had for literally decades. They do have some specific concerns though, and they might not be 100% wrong. We're gonna dive into some of the issues they had. First of all, Ronna McDaniel, RNC chairwoman had this to say, the commission is biased and has refused to enact simple and common sense reforms to help ensure fair debates, including hosting debates before voting begins and selecting moderators who have never worked for candidates on the debate stage. Uh, by the way, the commission has been hosting every presidential election uh, debate since 1988. So this has been for quite a while. And uh, it's not surprising though, because Donald Trump whined about the debate process constantly in the past elections. He refused to participate in some for a variety of different reasons, unless they paid him. Uh, he didn't like that some were being held uh, virtually because of coronavirus and all that. He's a big whiner, and so because of that, they all have to be. But Brett, I am I'm curious, do you think that's it? Or do you think they're gonna find some sort of other way to make these happen? This feels like right before the baseball season when there's like a lockout and they haven't hit their, you know, oh my God, we might not have a preseason. That's what it feels like. This is a negotiation. Um, I like there's been some crazy stuff that's happened with the debate group. And they do have some like very real good criticisms of it. I think, um, though, what the Republicans have a problem with is that they're boring and that they're actual debates. And whenever they're forced to be debates about the ideas, which is what they should be, um, a Trump isn't able to shine in the stupid way that he always shines, the WWE way of of shining. Um, but 
yeah, I, I think that watching debates under the current framework of the of basically what they pulled out of is like watching Shakespeare. Like you think you for the most part know what they're talking about unless you're an expert and you want to have an expert nearby to explain to you what just happened. But occasionally there'll be like some big broad slapstick moment where everybody's like, yeah, I even I got that. <laughs> yes, sir, you are no Jack Kennedy. Oops, yeah. like there's there's little moments. And so that is not in step with the thing that, because in the primary season, the parties run it. And so you get your ridiculous moments that you want, the specific moment that you want. Yeah. Um, and and that's- well, and- that's what I saw. I mean, I remember standing and laughing as Trump was annihilating all the pencil necks uh, next to him on stage during the first Republican primary debate in 2016. Yeah, yeah and the issue is uh, we learned a lot about him and about the rest of them, but not not much about what they would do. I mean, remember Trump was making claims about how he was going to do universal health care. Had that work out? Yeah, no, it's it's ridiculous. Like, I don't know what's going to be left of the elections soon after all this. So they're they're not doing the debates. Like, by the way, on the debates, someone reminded me, I completely forgot about this. Isn't it crazy what you can forget about in American politics? Uh, Trump tested positive for COVID and then showed up to debate with Joe Biden anyway. Yeah. There were no consequences for that. He could have killed Joe Biden anyway. Um, but yeah, so they're they're not gonna do they're not gonna do the debates. Uh, the Republicans don't do a platform anymore. There's more election than ever before, but less to it than ever before. It's like Skyrim, it's like bigger but shallower. There's just nothing to these elections anymore. I hope the Democratic primary at least has some substance because that's pretty much all we're gonna get. You got a television star in Trump and they want him to play to his strengths in every possible opportunity. And as I said earlier in this program, but like, they have a lot of confidence in their ability to effectively communicate to a lot of people in right wing media eco uh, echo chambers. Yeah. And so when you're doing a negotiation, you really have to ask like, what do I need? Mm-hmm. What, do, what do I need to in, in, engage in? And ask anyone in politics, if you're in the lead, you don't want to debate. Mm-hmm. So everybody's dodging debates. There's a bunch of people that just thoroughly dodge debates all the time. And if an entire party can get away with dodging a debate and still win, why wouldn't they? That's yeah. politics. Yeah. Uh, and practically, it's it's not the biggest show of confidence. Let's just note that. Anyway, uh, with that said, we're gonna take our second break. We come back, yet another Republican candidate uh, has been uh, alleged to have committed multiple acts of sexual assault. We're gonna be breaking all of those details down after this. During the chat, Brett came up with a false flagship for what's going on with the mosque. But no, it, it, it did actually go down. We're not asserting that it's a false flag, but their use of it certainly feels like that. Anyway, with that said, I think it's time to jump into some unfun with this. Early on when I got into politics at age 22 in Nebraska, I was groped at a political event by someone who is not a member of this body and not a current or former office holder. I buried it because I'd gone through a worse trauma in college and tried to minimize it just as I tried to minimize it when I've been touched inappropriately on this floor and in committee by members of this body. And most of you were on the floor when a member who on the mic talked about raping me on the floor of the legislature. That doesn't even get to the rape threats, the death threats, and sexual comments directed towards me on social media. Our policies definitely don't protect staff and they definitely don't protect female senators. Now that is a state senator Julie Slamia, uh, Slama uh, talking about a great variety of different instances of harassment and assault, both before and after becoming a state senator. And uh, there is a lot there that definitely needs to be looked into. Uh, every woman and state senators should not be an exception to this. Should be safe and comfortable, able to do their job. And clearly, that is not the case. However, she is also just one of a number of women that are making claims specifically about a candidate. Front runner in Nebraska's GOP gubernatorial primary, Charles Herbster, uh, has apparently assaulted, according to these allegations, a large number of women over the course of years from 2017 to this year. The women ranged in age from their late teens to mid 20s at the time of the incident. 
Eight women as of right now have come forward with allegations. It is possible that as this story is picked up and spread more will potentially. So in, in any event, I wanna get to some of the details. Starting with Ms. Slama, who says, uh, this is quoted by the Nebraska Examiner. She was appointed to the legislature back in January of 2019. She was in a crowded ballroom at the Douglas County Republican Party's annual Elephant Remembers Dinner that April when she was walking by Mr. Herbster. The news outlet reported that he then reached up her skirt without her consent and touched her inappropriately, which is just, I, I we can't. Have, we have heard so many instances like this, and I cannot conceive of a person making a choice like this, let alone constantly doing this and then going on to continue to run for office as so many of these people do. This is just the most recent Republican who has faced multiple allegations of either domestic abuse or sexual assault. Like we have to be specific in this video. If you're like jumping into the middle of the video, we're talking about Charles Herbster, not one of the many others that we've reported on, um, by the way. And he is the front runner to be governor. Another person at that event saw Herbster do this and told the examiner about it. Not that multiple witnesses will be enough to get Republicans necessarily to take this seriously, but to be clear, they're there. The witness and two others say that they saw Herbster grope another young woman on her buttocks at the same event, multiple assaults just at one event. Six women told the Nebraska Examiner that Herbster touched them inappropriately when they were selling hello or goodbye to him or when they were posing for a photograph by his side, with women saying that Herbster groped them on their buttocks outside of their clothes during political events or beauty pageants. Each woman says that she was grabbed, not inadvertently grazed by Herbster. It was an intentional thing. A seventh woman said that Herbster cornered her privately and kissed her forcibly. And this guy is, as we keep saying, the front runner. He is high profile. He is, in fact, endorsed by this individual, Donald Trump, writing an endorsement. Uh, he is apparently a tremendous supporter of America first, and he would be great for. I don't. I don't even want to read all the details, considering all that we know about him. But Trump is behind this guy, and do you think that these details are going to cause him to retract his endorsement? I hope I'm wrong. I hope he does, Brett. But I kind of doubt it. Just one disgusting detail of this: the former uh, mayor of Omaha. Just to give you an idea of what's happening and the other people who are supporting this guy. He inquired, you could look at this on her Twitter. He inquired to see what she was wearing when she got groped. And she tweeted a photograph of what she was wearing when she got groped. He's like, I wanna know more, I wanna know what she was wearing. That thing. That like at this point seems like who actually says, well, what were you wearing when you got groped? There are people in Nebraska politics, this sick cabal. And if you're like, oh, you know, there's something you always hear is like, this is a takedown from a, a disgruntled Democratic plant. No, Slama is a Republican, a very pro life Republican, outspoken. Like this is on like all of those things that they throw up there as a smoke screen to say, well, locker room talk. Like this guy, according to these accusations, does just start kissing them. Yeah. And regardless of like to dole out an endorsement, shouldn't and usually doesn't come without some level of heavy vetting. Yeah. As to whether the guy is doing heavy petting. And he is. And it doesn't seem to dissuade Trump from giving the old who's got two thumbs and supports and endorses serial gropers, this guy. Exactly. Yeah, they're 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 consistent. Uh, by the way, uh, these particular allegations, we don't know. It's possible he's been doing it to many other women for much longer. Started in 2017. Is it possible that he started to think, well, nobody cares about this stuff. You can get elected and do this, so why not just do it? And by the way, uh, Julie Slama, the, the, the woman that you saw in that video, who's just one again of eight women, she is a Republican. So I know some people would be like, well, why, why didn't you say something immediately? Why didn't you do something? No, but like this is a this is a well-connected, powerful person who is victimizing you. She wants this career. She believes that she should be able to run and hold office based on her merits or whatever. If she says something, who do you think they're gonna believe? Who do you think they're gonna side with? Is it more likely that he will face consequences or that her career is done? 
and that's it. And she's never getting endorsements. She's never winning election as a Republican. I can totally understand that fear. And she's explicitly said on the floor, like, I don't want to be defined by this. Yeah, that's a, that's exactly. the reason she has said, I don't want to be defined by this. I never did. It's yeah. come up. You've asked the question. You're going to get an answer. And guess what? She's going to be defined by this. And that's not that's one of the many things we've mentioned that's not fair to her exactly. and illegal. Exactly. Okay, uh, you know what? Like, really fast, one more thing. Charles Herbst, like to my theory that he might be like taking lessons from Trump, he says this: they did it with Brett Kavanaugh, they certainly did it with Donald J. Trump, and now they're trying to do it with Charles Herbster. That was not his spokesperson; that was him talking about himself in the first person. So the idea that he might pattern himself after Trump, I think there's something to it. Anyway, let's jump into kind of a ridiculous topic to close out our hour with this. Stay healthy on the campaign trail. Well, it's a lot of work. You know, when I'm speaking in front of 15 and 20,000 people and I'm up there using a lot of motion, uh, I guess in its own way, it's a, uh, it's a pretty healthy act. So there, that's Donald Trump talking about how he, when he does his YMCA dance or whatever, he's getting some exercise. But the thing is, while he, we wanted to play that for you, Partially to remind you that uh, Trump is now endorsing that guy to be the next Republican senator from Pennsylvania, which is ridiculous. Uh, the topic of health is something that he himself has been raising several times recently. And I wonder if it might be revealing something. He said in an interview recently with the Washington Post, you always have to talk about health. You look like you're in good health, but tomorrow you get a letter from a doctor saying, come see me again. That's not good when they use the word again. And he was asked last year if he would run again and said, well, one reason could be your health. You get a call from the doctor and that's the end of that. That stuff happens, you hope it doesn't. I just had a medical, just had great result. You never know, there are many things that can happen. Politics is a crazy world. It's a big commitment of you, your children, your wife, and your family. And in fact, in his endorsement of Dr. Oz, which I referenced, he brought up his own health too. Now he's pretending that he's in good health, but. He does, he has multiple times now referenced doctors giving you bad news and how that might affect your willingness to run again or your ability to run again. I personally think that Trump is far less strategic than just stream of consciousness. Is it possible, Brett, that he has been having some difficult conversations about his health? He's like 76 years old and he hasn't been in, in good health for decades seemingly. I don't know, we need to find the sacred amulet that his soul is stuck in to see if it's melting or something like that. Like I we all know destroy this. Destroy that horcrux. Only the good die young, you know what I mean? Uh, it, it's what it is, it's just, I mean, that's what I've resigned myself to is when he goes and has those little, uh, you know, heart diagnoses and goes and does the EKG or whatever the hell. I'm certain he's one of those people where the doctors look at him and be like, how is this guy still up and running? But his heart's still working against all odds. Um, and I, what, regardless of what the case is, I am not going to take any uh, appraisal of Trump's health seriously if it's remotely connected to Dr. Oz exactly. or any TV doctor who's on there to huck BS <laughs> merchandise. Exactly. Uh, look, I agree with you, but um, uh, uh, Donald, if you're, if you're watching this, uh, I do think that it's important that you watch out for your health and you should get advice from the best doctor. So anything that Dr. Oz tells you to do to safeguard your health, that's what you should do. And only those things, you should take the supplements and pills he tells you to take. And that's it, don't listen to those other doctors that went to schools and stuff, what do they know? Listen to Dr. Oz. Anyway, it is possible that he is worried about his health. It is possible some people are raising the possibility that he's putting that out there so that if he decides not to run, he can claim that's why rather than polling or maybe DeSantis raises a ton of money. I don't know. Anyway, just something to think about as we get closer to that primary. He's gonna figuratively now, run even though there's no way he can physically run. He's not gonna run, he's just gonna do his dance like this. Anyway, if you're listening on the podcast, <clears throat> 
want to thank you so much for being here. Really do appreciate you. By the way, if you are on the podcast, consider rating and reviewing our podcast on Apple Podcasts. That's very helpful for discoverability. Uh, now, if you are watching on the members app or YouTube or Twitch, don't go anywhere because we've got a lot to get to, including Charlie Kirk's insane conflation of the trans community and inflation, as well as the throwing away of the garbage people of the day. So we're gonna take a quick couple minute break, but hold on to your butts because we'll be back in just a few. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.